Audio level check. Second check. Audio level second check. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and ten. One, two, three. Looks good on the little shore mixer. And that's a check. Let's give it a listen. This meeting was conceived uh, as much as four years ago um, uh, in, in Berkeley, California, uh, with Rob Carlson and Roger Brent, and it didn't happen. The reason it's happening today here at MIT is entirely due to <coughs> these people here. Um, and you'll hear more about each of them later, but I just wanted to recognize uh, their contributions, which are entirely voluntary. Um, so much as that's possible, and uh, have done an exceptional job pulling this together. I also want to acknowledge uh, a number of institutions and individuals who have contributed to the uh, conference financially, in particular the Computational and Systems Biology Initiative at MIT, the MIT Synthetic Biology Working Group, New England Biolabs, uh, the Department of Energy via um, Oak Ridge National Laboratory, Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, uh, IEEE EMB, CME Ventures, gene art, and compound therapeutics. So synthetic biology, uh, you can approach it from two perspectives. One perspective is to look at the science of biology and consider how biology might transition from a discovery science to a synthetic science. 
So on the screen is a depiction of the genome of Phyx-174. This organism was mapped um, by classical genetics prior to sequencing. It was sequenced and studied um, as a string of information, and it was synthesized this year. Right? So, so what do we do as scientists in biology as we can begin to directly manipulate the genetic material of organisms and use that as a tool for scientific discovery? Right? So you can ask, here's a depiction of the Y chromosome, part of the Y chromosome of a human being. Um, how that same technology might be applied to other organisms and if we should make um, such technology uh, deployable in, in this fashion. Another example of the application of synthetic biology uh, as a tool uh, for discovery science um, is illustrated by the work of here Michael Elowitz. This is showing uh, the output of his repressilator system, which is a synthetic genetic network he put into a bacteria. Uh, the network was designed to have the bacteria blink over time. And what you're seeing here is a field of cells uh, some time after they've grown, and the cells are blinking, but they're not all in the same state, right? So this system is, is interesting to me because it's an example of a physicist uh, constructing a model of how the world should be working and then implementing a physical instance of that system as a synthetic construct, right? If you're clever about how you do that, differences between what you expect to observe and what you actually observe may highlight interesting new science that's worth figuring out, right? So the simple example here is that not all the cells are in the same state at this instant in time, even though they're all direct genetic descendants of one another. Um, Michael's subsequent work, and we're grateful that he's here, characterizing variability in the behavior of cells is a, is a, is a beautiful piece of science that, that I think is based on what was initially a synthetic approach in part. Synthetic biology is also about the engineering of biology, right? So you can look at biology as a technology, technology for processing information, for manipulating energy and chemicals, for assembling materials, and for maintaining and perhaps enhancing health. And so the question is, how should we best develop this technology and what should we do, right? So we can look at the ribosome and say, we've got a programmable nano assembler, something that actually works. We have a functioning nanotechnology here. We can also build much bigger things. Maybe we can improve the human condition by, for example, implementing very small amounts of memory and logic in places where we currently have none. And maybe we can program bacteria to do useful things, right? So, so one of the challenges here is, is as you set out to engineer biology, we're running into a, a, an engineering challenge as big as any we've likely ever encountered. And so as a group, how might we think about organizing ourselves now to get this work done? Uh, the development of this uh, endeavor is, is in part being driven by the advent of certain technologies. And so the plot here was put together by Rob Carlson in the audience today. And it shows the um, capacity for DNA synthesis as a function of time. And you know, I'll let you talk with Rob about the statistics, uh, but the trend seems clear. It's going up. Um, and so what you might ask yourself uh, in response to this data um, we're going to be able to write DNA. Uh, what should we say? What do we have to say? Are we worried about what other people might say um, if we presume that they can do the same thing? So we have the science of biology that we can approach in new ways. We can develop biology as a technology via the systematic engineering of the living world. And this is taking place in the context of underlying technologies, which are changing how we approach um, all of these endeavors. Why are we here? Uh, to get as many of us in the same room to talk about it, right? What's real? What's not real? What are we likely to be able to do? How can we best work together? Uh, what do we want to have come out of this? Are there good specific outcomes and can we articulate them now so that it makes it obvious that we should be doing the work? Um, are there specific technologies that it would be nice to have that we do, we do not now have? And if there are, how do we define the research agenda and the programmatic needs that get us to those endpoints? The last big component of the meeting is to begin the process of talking about the consequences of success. Um, are there ways that we should organize the ownership of genetic information and biological materials? Are there things that we're concerned about, uh, the application of this technology to construct risks? Uh, or are those concerns unfounded, given our own past experiences? Um, so to lay it out, right, we've got two and a half days. Uh, the first two days are a series of plenary lectures, uh, and I'm extremely grateful for each of the scientists who've decided to participate. Uh, each of them is extraordinary, and it's a really amazing group. 
The lectures will be held to 30 minutes, and we've got a good 10-minute discussion block. So we're definitely hoping that people ask hard questions and, and really push on stuff to see what's going on and, and where people hope to, to take things in the future. We have three discussion periods, one on property, one on risk, and one on ethics. Um, and each of those is meant to begin the process of engaging all of us together to figure out how we should best proceed. Uh, we've asked um, everybody to participate so much as they're able throughout the entire conference. Uh, there'll be food and, and poster sessions and so on and so forth. And so we're hoping and very much looking forward to, to interacting with everybody. I've been asked to, to, to remind everyone to, to wear these badges uh, so that we can keep track of what's going on and we don't have um, uh, an overflow situation in the room. So I think with that, I'll turn the, the session over to Samantha Sutton. Samantha's a graduate student in biological engineering here at MIT, and she's in charge. Well, hello, and um, can you guys hear me? Is this on? Yes? No? Yeah, there we go. Okay. So on behalf of the organizing committee of this conference, I once again would like to welcome all of you to this conference. Um, it's great to see this, uh, this auditorium almost full at 9 o'clock in the morning. It's a really good feeling to see all of you out there. Um, as you said, my name is Samantha Sutton, and I'm going to be your uh, session chair for this morning's session on engineering protein components. So I'm pleased to announce our first speaker. It's Homa Halinga. He's from Duke University, and he's going to be talking about the role of computational protein design in synthetic biology. Homa? Thank you, and thanks for the invitation to this uh, really wonderful conference. I think the organizers, uh, Drew Andy and his committee, have done an absolutely marvelous job in assembling uh, a really wide range of speakers. So what I want to tell you about today are some uh, efforts that we started to develop in trying to uh, engineer components in biological systems. So just to uh, just a brief overview of the kind of things that you might try to think about is uh, obviously there are biological systems have all sorts of interesting components we can start thinking about. And you know you can start with receptors on the outside of the cell that are going to listen to the local environment chemically and then do things, signal construction pathways that have all sorts of interesting consequences. There will be DNA binding proteins of the DNA chemistry, there are going to be enzymes that, that you can assemble into metabolic pathways, membrane channels that have, provide inputs to enzyme pathways and maybe export interesting products. Lots and lots of opportunities for building synthetic systems, synthetic receptors and synthetic signal transduction pathways, synthetic genetic circuits, synthetic metabolic pathways, you name it. Um, and you're going to hear a lot about that in the next few days. What we are interested in is asking the question of how can we go beyond what the natural diversity is that nature provides for us? How can we build on the various machines, enzymes, the binding proteins, receptors that nature has, has provided in us and diversify them in ways that we are interested in to, if you will, program the synthetic pathways that uh, we're going to be uh, building? So the idea is that what we do is we start what um, I think Drew, certainly Drew introduced me to this term, a connection of engineerable parts. These are basically proteins that for one reason or another we find interesting and we're going to manipulate them. We're going to manipulate their, their uh, functional properties. We're con mostly concerned with function, de novo genesis of function. So these could be structural scaffolds which might be derived from uh, superfamilies of proteins. To a protein engineer like myself, superfamily spells engineerable, because nature basically has taken a protein fold and done lots and lots of different things with it. That could, if you're interested in developing enzymes, you might say, okay, you know, 
we don't want to reinvent the entire wheel. We'll start with some interesting mechanistic archetypes, cofactor biology or other types of specific uh, mechanistic aspects of enzyme, enzyme mechanism, and we will diversify those, those enzymes. Or we say, all right, you know, we're going to try and connect with what bi biology has already built. I mean, one way to think about what we're trying to do here is that you're not trying to reinvent biology in, in synthetic systems. You're trying to build on what already exists. In other words, it's a form of evolution. You could start with functional archetypes. You could say, okay, we'll start with the set of DNA repressors, and we'll make our own repressor proteins out of these. We would take existing membrane pores and adapt them to our own uses. Or we take molecular motors, for instance, and make them transport or move things that we are interested in. Now, adaptation of function. So all, all I'm saying is here, there's lots of different starting points for adaptation of function. And there are also, of course, many different ways to adapt function. You could do computational design, which is what we're particularly interested in. And you'll see why we think that computational design is a good way to adapt protein function. And in computational design, what you do is you actually take the three-dimensional structure of a protein, experimentally determined by X-ray crystallography, for instance, and you use that to uh, introduce mutations that you, that, you that you select, if you will, uh, computationally. And this allows you to make very large moves in sequence and functional space. You can really make dramatic changes, adaptations, if you will, of proteins and their functions. And of course, there are other ways of doing it too. You can use directed evolution methods, and you're gonna hear, you're gonna hear about that as well. Once you've done that, there are several things you can do with your new engineered part. Uh, you could use it as a material and reagent in and of itself. For instance, and you're going to hear about this, we can build biosensors out of proteins. So now the protein is not used as a biological material, it's used as a chemical. It just happens to be biologically derived. Or, and that's of course what we're talking about here, you can reintegrate them into synthetic systems and build your own favorite uh, synthetic system you're after. So that sets the scene. What I'm going to tell you a little bit about today are the, the efforts we've started in, in, in trying to execute this program. And the previous slide where I showed the many different components you can think about is, is a wish list, of course. I'm going to tell you about our efforts in the redesign of receptors and the design of enzyme activity. So let's think about receptor design. So what we're going to do here is we're going to take a three-dimensional structure for receptor and we're going to radically alter its ligand binding properties so it can now recognize things that we are interested in recognizing. And if, uh, if you do that, you have to basically, uh, you're playing around with the basic rules of molecular recognition and have to build stereochemically complementary surfaces, which we do computation, as I'll show you in a minute. And then we can use these ex vivo as materials to build biosensors. And then in vivo, we can use them to build uh, programmable signal transduction pathways. So, the input layer of receptors is now, is now informed by our uh, 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 en engineered receptors. So who are the players? Well, the set of engineerable parts that we use for our efforts happen to be the periplasmic binding proteins from E. coli. This is a superfamily of proteins. They uh, occur throughout the biosphere. Many of them are involved in, uh, in, in receptor biology, in prokaryotes. These are uh, proteins that recognize solutes and either uh, use them to import solutes into the cytoplasm or uh, uh, inform chemotactic uh, signal transduction pathways so that E. coli, for instance, swims towards the source of goodies or avoids sources of things that it doesn't like to be near. They, can, uh, they also exist in eukaryotes. They, uh, the, this fold here, the so-called maltose binding protein, is uh, very, actually, sorry, it's the glutamine binding protein, is very similar to a fold uh, found in the, the, the GLU-R receptor, which is a receptor at the nerve terminals that recognizes neurotransmitters, just as an example. There, uh, another famous example of this fold is, in fact, in a, ve in a very familiar repressor. It's LAC-I. The LAC repressor, the lactose binding part of the LAC repressor happens to look like maltose binding protein. There are enzymes that look like this. So it's a superfamily. And as I mentioned to you earlier, superfamily to us spells engineerable. What we're going to do with these proteins, uh, once we've engineered them, one thing we're going to do is we're going to build biosensors uh, of them. Let me just briefly explain to you about biosensors. So a biosensor is, a, for our purpose of talk, is a, is a protein that when a binds its cognate ligand, transduces the binding event into simple physical signal 
such as changes in fluorescence or electrochemistry. And one reason that we chose this protein superfamily is they have a nice property, which is shown on the slide here. They go, undergo a ligand-mediated hinge bending motion. So here what you see is maltose binding protein as it morphs between the extra structures of the APO open form and the bound closed form as it binds the green disaccharide here. And what we can do is we can use this binding motion to engineer in uh, physical signal transduction elements that, uh, that allow us to build reagentless biosensor detectors. So in this particular case, what we're interested in building a fluorescent detector. So what we do is we take an environmentally sensitive fluorophore like this one, and we put it in positions in the protein where the protein, because of the motion you're seeing, undergoes a local structural change. For instance, this little flap here is close to this alpha helix. So this is, if you will, a little crevice that opens and closes in concert with the ligand-mediated binding motion, but the crevice is not itself part of the binding site. And if you take an environmentally sensitive fluorophore and put it in there, as the crevice opens and closes, the environment of the fluorophore changes and hence the fluorescence intensity changes. So here, in the absence of malt, there's very little fluorescence. The presence of malt, there's lots of fluorescence. And you actually can get a fluorescent uh, maltose detector. Not that one particular interest in that, necessarily. You can also do these electrochemically. This is an aside, and this is a, uh, really an exercise in nanotechnology. What you do is you take a gold electrode, which you derivatize with thin film, onto which you lay down a monolayer of the maltose binding protein, simply by virtue of having a his tag at the bottom of the binding protein, which can uh, bind to uh, nickel groups, which have been doped into this little layer. And the trick that you play is you uh, you, you modify the maltose binding protein with a, an electrochemical a, a redox reporter group. Uh, and you sandwich the redox reporter group in between the maltose binding protein and the gold electrode. In the absence of maltose, the system is in an extended state, and the cofactor is in good electronic contact with the gold, so you should get a, a good flow of current between the, current, uh, between the gold and the cofactor. Now, maltose comes along, and you get a mechanical change, and you, and you actually contract the maltose binding protein, and you weaken that uh, coupling effect. So you get a weak current. And this actually works if you build these electrodes. If you look at the uh, uh, potential applied to the gold electrode in the absence of maltose, as a, and you look at the current, in the absence of maltose as a high current, you add maltose current goes down, and you actually get a hyperbolic binding curve. And this is a reagentless uh, a electrochemical sensor. That's to say, the composition of the sensor does not change uh, as a function of the binding event. And as long as you know where to make the mutation, cysty mutations, where you can couple fluorophores electrochemical reporter groups, you can convert any of these periplasmic binding proteins into reagentless sensors, which is exactly what we've done. So on the previous uh, couple of slides ago, when I showed you the panel of different sensors, We've actually got sensors for all of those, including uh, a glucose sensor, which is of uh, great utility in, in, in management of diabetes. But we want to go beyond the natural diversity of the binding protein family. We want to be able to program what we want to, uh, to bind. So, and we do this computationally. So we start with a detailed three-dimensional structure of uh, the periplasmic binding protein, which is well represented by a little blob here. And what we do is we take out the cognate ligand and replace it with an ensemble of the new ligand that explores all the degrees of freedom of the new ligand in this old binding pocket. And these, this is the tumbling and the translational motions in the binding pocket and the internal degrees of freedom. At the same time, we allow the layer residues that used to interact with the wild type uh, ligand to mutate in silico in response to the new ligand. And what we look for is the best possible dock new ligand with the best possible mutated stereochemically complementary by, uh, surface, where best possible is defined as a minimum of a potential function, which simply is van der Waals, electrostatics, hydrogen bonding, some solvation, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, now, this is a very large combinatorial problem. And the reason is that you, know, you typically have about 15 to 20 residues that form the, the, the actual binding surface. So in sequence space alone, you have 10 to the fifth, uh, 20 to 15 to 20 to 20 possible sequences that you want to sift through. But in three dimensions, sequences aren't represented by 20 letters. 
they're represented by however many structures you need to represent the degrees of freedom, the internal degrees of freedom of amino acid side chains, which are called rhodomers. And it so happens that we use roughly 6,000 uh, rhodomeric rhodomers to represent 20 amino acids. So you have 6,000 to the power 15, 6,000 to the power 20 possible rhodomeric sequences that you have to sift through times the sampling density you're using in a docking zone to place your ligands. And this tends to get to ridiculously large numbers. So you might have to sift through 10 to 200 to 10 to the 1,000 rhodomeric sequences. And we jokingly call this a super astronomically large problem because it's, it, there are more choices than there are particles in the, in the universe, in the known universe. But it turns out that there are deterministic algorithms that can solve this problem. These are called dead-end elimination algorithms. We did not invent these. These were originally invented, invented by a, Belgian, uh, a group of Belgian mathematicians led by uh, De Smet, uh, who were interested in, in solving uh, homology modeling problems. And then Steve Mayo started to apply these to protein design problems. And we took these original set of algorithms and souped them up so we can apply them to our particular design problem. And I don't have time to go through the details of how these algorithms work, just take my word that there exists an algorithm that can solve this problem. So what you do then is you take your favorite protein and you carve out a cavity that is the ligand binding site and you replace that with slate polyalanine, which is a way of saying this is an unwritten slate. I haven't decided what I'm going to do yet. You define your docking zone by some kind of hull, in this case a convex hull, in which a, a ligand is allowed to rotate. So then you take your favorite ligand here, this happens to be a nerve agent, uh, and you uh, form a, an ensemble of the possible conformations of the nerve agent, and you place that ensemble inside this, uh, this defined hull, and you start sifting through the sequences that form stereochemically complementary surfaces using the dead elimination algorithm. You start with this huge search space, and you, then you reduce it to an arbitrarily smaller number, which are about um, 10,000 uh, poses and complementary surfaces that are good starting points. So these are, these are stereochemically reasonable. One limitation of the algorithm is that the force field has to be pairwise decomposable. So only pairs of residues know about each other. So you know, groups of three can't know about each other. So what you then do is you take this initial set of poses and you rank them in more detail where you have a more detailed representation of the molecular world. And so you look at these in more detail, and you, now you reduce it to about 1,000. And then what you do is you say, all right, you know, I've got 1,000 really good starting points which have been arrived at by this particular method. I'm now going to go and stochastically explore, explore them a little bit by making random point mutations in my starting points. Okay? And I'm going to look at them with the more detailed potential function to see what I can rank them, and just to make sure that I've populated the available sequence space reasonably well. So this builds it up again. And then after ranking, you reduce it to about 10. And 10 is a magic number. It's, it's about the limit that my students are willing to build in a laboratory. Um, and you know these can be, as I said, 15 to 20 mutations. Not, not a totally trivial fabrication problem. Now, this algorithm actually works. So, for the paraplasmic binding proteins that I showed you, we took a subset of three or four of them, and we've actually created uh, proteins that instead of binding their cognate sugars or amino acids, now bind these ligands. And this slide is slightly out of date. There are a couple more uh, on there. And they, as you can see, these ligands span a, a very large uh, uh, chemical space. Before I go into that, here are actual binding curves. So you know, we have real experimentally active uh, paraplas computationally designed paraplasmic binding proteins. So they, you know, we combine things like TNT, which is an explosive, uh, and, and so we have sensors for TNT, or RDX, lactates, dihydroxyacetate and phosphate metabolites, neurotransmitters, drugs, a few more drugs now. Uh, PMPA, which is actually what I showed you on the previous slide. PMPA is a surrogate of SOMAN, which is a uh, nerve agent that's being is one of the weapons of mass destruction uh, that's not being found. Um, <laughs> mustard gas, another one that's uh, is of the same ilk. MTBE is a, is a gasoline anti-knock uh, agent uh, that was originally added to reduce uh, air pollution, but turns out to be rather cytotoxic and is a very water soluble and is a groundwater pollutant. Uh, glyphosate, which you know is Roundup. So we can actually 
as I said, here are some binding curves. And here's, here's an example in a little bit more detail. This is, these are TNT binding proteins. So you take ribose binding protein or rabinose or histidine binding protein as starting points in the calculation. You do these large calculations, and then you uh, build representative designs in these binding proteins. And you start with different engineerable parts because a priori, you don't know which engineerable part is going to be very well adaptable. And um, you get a range of binding curves, one of which is particularly good. This is a two nanomolar binding protein in ribose binding protein. Here's the actual experimentally determined binding curve. And the reason it's good is that the, um, this, you can barely see this, but the, the ring of, of TNT is sandwiched between two phenylalanines that were predicted in, by the computer algorithm. And, and all the nitro groups are nicely satisfied. The uh, proteins are. Uh, so it can be quite tight binders. They're quite specific. So if you look at so-called decoys where you lack nitro groups or the, ben the uh, methyl groups, you make trinitrobenzene, then you will find, and that's what this, these, this diagram shows here, that the target TNT binds more tightly than the decoys. Here's actually the uh, surrogate binding protein, the, so the, the PMPA binding protein. Again, we started with ribose and with glucose binding protein, and you get a range of answers. And we looked at these in a, in a little bit more detail. And we know, for instance, that the interactions that we put in are indeed what you find in the real protein. What's, the reason I'm bringing this up is because one thing that's interesting about this group of designs is that it shows something kind of important, and that is the, the designs differ not only, uh, in the way that the PMPA, the organophosphate, is oriented in the binding site. In some, the, the, the phosphonate group points into the binding site, in the others it points out of the binding site. And these get very different sequences, and they're all binders. What it tells you is that the solution space, in, sequ in sequence space, the solutions are highly degenerate. There are many different, in sequence space, there are many different uh, sequences that give you the same answer. This degeneracy is, must be a fundamental property of biological systems, because if the answer is required were so rare to find, then it would be very difficult to discover proteins by stochastic evolution. All right, what about putting them back? So I showed to you we can have them as, as biosensors ex vivo. What about putting them back and build synthetic signal transduction pathways? The idea is now we put a receptor into E. coli, it turns on some pathway, and then transcribes some suitable reporter gene, like green fluorescent protein. It turns out that Several of periplasmic binding proteins are involved in natural uh, signal transduction pathways. The very famous ones, the two component signal transduction pathways, involved with chemotaxis. So, maltose binding protein and glucose and ribose binding protein, when they bind their cognate ligand and assume the closed form, interact with transmembrane receptors that uh, stimulate histidine kinases and then, through a complicated uh, uh, cascade of events, uh, control the rotation of the E. coli flagellum, and you get a chemotactic response. Two component signal transduction pathways are all over the pl place in prokaryotes, and there are others that happen to control gene transcription. Uh, some examples are shown here. And what you can do is you can make chimeric pathways where you take the periplasmic binding domains that interact with the periplasmic proteins, and then you take the cytoplasmic histidine kinases that are part of these pathways and you make chimeric versions of these such that these, cyto these histidine kinases that control transcription now listen to these periplasmic binding domains. Okay? So now you've connected, or reconnected if you will, the input layer, which is the periplasmic binding protein input layer that we can play with, with a connection layer that controls an output layer, gene transcription, that we are much more interested in than, than chemotaxis. And of course, the idea is to diversify, adapt the input layer, program the input layer, such that it can listen to all these goodies or nasties, uh, depending on your point of view. All right, does this actually work? And the answer is yes, it does. So here's an example of a synthetic signal transduction pathway where we've taken a, a chimeric histidine kinase with the periplasmic binding do, uh, domain from chemotaxis that talks to ribose or glucose binding protein. When uh, RBP or GBP binds to this, uh, to this histidine kinase, it phosphorylates OMB-R, which is a transcriptional regulator uh, uh, activator 
of uh, of C actually, which you can actually, which you can control and you can use to control beta galactosidase. So the output layer is beta gal activity. And here you see uh, the system being programmed with wild type ribose binding protein. In the absence of ribose, you have uh, less transcription. And then you add ribose, so you get an increase in transcription. So it listens to the input layer listens to ribose. And here we have beta gal controlled by TNT uh, or by lactate or by zinc. We have a, a, a version of uh, ribose binding protein that binds zinc, which I didn't tell you about. Now the trouble with this layer, with, with this circuit, is that, I, I say this rather carefully, you have upregulation of transcriptions. You have actually rather high basal levels of transcription that you then, uh, whose levels you increase, which is what coli wants for its particular purposes. What we are interested in is something that's off and becomes on. So we had to re-engineer the output circuit. Now, in our case, it was a fairly simple re-engineering exercise. What we did is we took omp R, and rather than use it as an activator, we use it as a repressor. It's easier to control things with repressors than with activators. Activators, you have to worry about how to interact with RNA polymerase. With repressors, you just get in the way of RNA polymerase. But now you would have inverted the logic. So now we control a repressor in itself. So a repressor that controls a repressor, which happens to control green fluorescent protein or, uh, or uh, chloramphenicol resistance. This circuit, in detail, is quite complicated, and I don't have time to go through it. But here's the output of it. These are photographs of Petri dishes that contain the bacteria with these synthetic circuits. And we're looking at the GFP produced by these bacteria. So in the absence of ribose, with, with wild type ribose binding protein, there are no glowing bacteria here. Or they have low level of glow. Ribose increases the glow. Lactate, 5-fluorouracil. This is a compute, computation designed one, another computation designed one. Here are TNT guys, MTBE guys. So these become biological sentinels that listen to pollutants or threats in their local chemical environment. OK, if you can design receptors, you should also be able to design enzymes. And here the idea is that you provide a chemically active surface that ca uh, carries out specific chemistries. You may have to stabilize the transition state. And then the rest of the protein uh, of the binding site is a stereochemically complementary surface. So we have a specialized algorithm that places the residues that you pre-choose that do this stuff, and then you combine that with the receptor design algorithm to build an entire enzyme. The reaction that we chose to work with is triosphosphate isomerase, and as, an, as an example. It interconverts dihydroxyacetone phosphate and glycerol that free phosphate. It's a glycolytic enzyme. It's a very well-known enzyme. It's a unimolecular reaction. That does two acid-base chemistries. It goes via an indialate intermediate. Very well characterized structurally, very well characterized um, uh, mechanistically, and there's a genetic selection available for it in E. coli. So the experiment then is to take ribose binding protein, which is not an enzyme at all, and make it into a triose phosphate isomerase. This is real wild type TIM, evolved, naturally evolved TIM. The two don't look like one another at all. So this is, if you will, a form of convergent evolution by computation. The search algorithm, very briefly, you have your substrate, you define the residues you're interested in, and the definition is geometrical, so you, you set up bond lengths and bond angles and torsional relationships that describe the interaction geometry of these residues with the substrate. And these, these geometries are, are, are not unique. There are many different ways of doing the same chemistry, so they become combinatorial objects in and of themselves. You use that combinatorial object, and then you um, introduce it into your protein. As a, first, as a first exercise, what we did is we did a receptor design calculation in, in uh, ribose binding protein. We asked, can RBP simply bind its substrates? Because if it can't, there's no point in making an enzyme out of it. And if you do a calculation like that, you find that uh, RBP is a fine receptor for the substrates. Now you introduce catalysis. So we have the catalytic residues and then the binding surface, and we built four different families which differ in the positioning of the three catalytic residues. And within each family, there's subfamily members that simply differ in the, in the stereochemical complementary surface. 14 designs in total. Seven out of 14 were, about, were enzymatically active. One of them was quite active. Let's look at that in a little bit more detail. This is the slightly more active one, Novotim 1.0. Um, what we're showing here is so you have simple assays which you can follow colorimetrically. What we're showing here is the progress curve of an assay that basically tells you that this enzyme has multiple turnovers and completely converts substrate into product. And it's a Michaelis enzyme. Uh, and it is nicely inhibited by phosphoglycolate, which is a uh, 
uh, natural inhibitor of triphosphate isomerase. The problem with this Novo Tim 1.0 is the stability of this, and the turnover number is about 0.05 per second, so it's not a particularly brilliant enzyme. Uh, but the rate enhancement is about uh, slightly more than 10 to the fifth. The problem is it's not quite as thermostable as we'd like. So what we did now is we, in, in, in addition to simply uh, evolving that first layer, we also evolved the second layer. These are now about 22 residues that we're mutating simultaneously. And the idea is that the second layer in blue uh, gives you a better uh, com stereochemically complementary surface uh, for the protein, so that the whole system together is, is nicely packed and becomes a good stereochemical, stereochemically complementary protein. And this now, this new protein, uh, NovoTim 2.1, uh, 2.0, uh, actually is almost as thermostable, oh, sorry, 1.2, it's almost as thermostable as the parent protein, so that worked very well, and it's a very good enzyme. Uh, it has a turnover number of about 0.1 in one direction, 0.8 in another direction. Uh, if you look at a uh, little bit more detail, you see that the pH profile of the enzyme is at the wild type. If you do alanine scanning mutagenesis of the residues in the catalytic residues, you find that they're important, so the, the design is basically kosher. Is it biologically active? Well, so here's, uh, what, this is what Tim does. It interconverts DHAP and, and GAP. And when you grow on, on gluconeogenic uh, uh, substrate like glycerol or lactate, you absolutely require Tim activity. Glycerol is more demanding on lactate because glycerol makes DHAP, which spontaneously decomposes the methylglyoxal, so it's cytotoxic. So if you build up a glycerol, uh, DHAP pool from glycerol, you really need to push it in gap. The deletion strain can't grow. Wild type, of course, can grow. Novotin 1.2 can grow on lactate, but not quite on glycerol, which gives you a perfect uh, uh, opportunity to do a little direct evolution. You take your computational design, you bash it a little bit with with PCR, uh, dirty PCR mutagenesis, and then you select for glycerol positive uh, mutants. And that actually works. And now Novo, these Novo Tims now go, uh, grow both on lactate and on glycerol. And the interesting thing is it took only a tiny kick in activity, about two to three fold, to uh, get uh, biologically active Tims. Uh, and let me stop here and um, so what I've shown you is that with computational design, we can radically alter the binding properties and even enzymatic properties of uh, engineerable parts. The engineerable parts can be put back into biological systems, and we have the beginnings of synthetic transsignal transduction pathways, and we see that it might be possible even to create synthetic metabolic pathways. And these are the people that actually did the work, my students and postdocs, and I'm uh, we'll name uh, Mary Dwyer, who did a lot of the work uh, on Novotin, and uh, a number of those receptors that you saw, helped by Lauren Luger, who did a lot of the computational uh, algorithm development that we used. Uh, Shahir Visk and Ma Marlon Allard were responsible for the surrogate uh, uh, SOMAN detector, uh, and all these other people are doing a lot of other wonderful things in the lab right now. And I thank you very much for your attention. So now we have 10 minutes for questions, um, and we're going to kind of work. We have two microphones that will be passed around through the audience, so we're going to have one microphone for this half of the room, one for that half of the room, and we'll alternate between the two sides of the room. So who would like to ask the first question? Yes, right here. Oh. Too many mics. Um, I wondered if your... Uh, design problem was actually even more complex than you suggested, because I don't know if this is generally true for this family of proteins, but certainly for a rabinose binding protein, there are water molecules in the binding site that play an essential part in the binding process. And if you design, if you design them out with hydroxyl-containing side chains, the binding is less good. Is that the kind of thing that your computational algorithm would pick up, or is that, is that an additional layer of complexity? It's an additional layer of complexity. We can introduce water-mediated hydrogen bonds, but we haven't, okay? Um, and you're quite right. Uh, a number of the sugars are indeed water-mediated. Um, with the ligands that we used, we, we didn't introduce that, but it can be put into the algorithm. Basically, it becomes uh, the waters are incorporated into, this, into the amino acid side chains and make an extended amino acid. 
Um, is there a way that you can um, use the design successes and, and failures to modify the potential functions that you're using to make the designs? Yes, and um, I, we, we do, and I didn't have time to show you this. Um, so for the lactate designs, okay, which I didn't show you, we have, we have ri uh, ribose and glucose binding proteins that bind L-lactate or D-lactate, depending on the design, and they're, 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 they are uh, chirally selective. In the first round of designs, we um, got a wide range of binding constants, ranging from micromolar to high millimolar even. Okay, what's nice about lactate is you can actually measure that. And we use that information to construct a, a, an, an empirically calibrated potential function where we constructed a, a quantitative structure activity relationship. And in front of each of the uh, terms that we use in our potential function, we, we put a, a linear weight that we optimize so that the, the calculated energy and observed binding constant are more or less coincident. Then you use that calibrated potential function and use that to design lactate binding proteins again. And two observations. One, that the spread, instead of being over four orders of magnitude, collapsed completely. And we got, low micro, uh, we got high nanomolar binders uh, which was better than the best one we found in the, in the other method. That's one answer. The other answer is we have much more sophisticated electrostatics now than we have in, in the earlier designs. I have a, another slide that shows you a table of progress, and as, you can, and as we introduce more complexity, you basically get better answers. Uh, the ribose binding protein is outside the cell membrane. Isn't the native TIM inside the cell membrane? How yes. does it work? So. Um, RBP can be expressed cytoplasmically, cytoplasmically just by, by removing the uh, secretion layer, secretion uh, sequence, excuse me. But it's very simple. Uh, here. I suppose you... I suppose you are uh, doing your design with fixed backbone. Yes. So the backbone structure won't change. This would indeed uh, um, uh, add another few degrees of freedom if you would uh, take that into account. Isn't it necessary? Yes. I mean, isn't isn't so movement of backbone obviously not necessary for having a good binder? Um, so you're quite right. In our in the designs I showed you, the backbone is kept fixed. We now have ways of uh, introducing backbone motions, uh, which we've just started to do both for small-scale motions, where you just allow the side chain to move, to wriggle a little bit, and for larger-scale motions, where you might play around with the open-closed form, play around with loop structures. I can tell you that if you wriggle, just wriggle the side chains a little bit, or just local vibrations, if you will, then in silico, we haven't done the experiments yet, in silico, you predict that you get better TNT binders. So we'll see how it works out. But basically, as you add more complexity into the design process, so far, at any rate, Let's hope this trend continues. So far, things continue to look better than they were before. Um, for, right here. for the maltose binding setup, um, all your ligands are very small. I assume that reflects the binding pocket you're working with. Um, is it, um, what's the maximal size ligand you can possibly target with that? So, we have to match the size of the ligand, that we, the, the new ligand, to roughly the size of the old ligand, as we've learned. And in fact, Maltose binding protein we haven't done too many designs with because its binding pocket is a little too large. It's a, it's a disaccharide. Uh, in terms of what can we, uh, the, the upper limit that we can do, well, it depends on, at this stage, it depends on what nature has to offer us. And there are oligopeptide binding proteins in this family, so we have large pockets we can play with. So we can probably capture anything from a, you know, a few hundred Daltons up to roughly 800 Daltons. So a lot of uh, chemical space can be captured in this particular way. Hopefully, over time, we will learn how to go beyond the exact scaffold that nature has offered us and adapt the scaffold structures as, as well. I have a question about the design of specificity, ah. and, uh, uh, which you'll be familiar with. I'll just ask it, which is, if you want to bind something interesting, it's for an asteroid. So then, if you want to do this in practice, you may want to bind that thing specifically and not bind something else. Right. And so, what's the comment about Very good question, as you. Um, so the question was, how do I 
the design and specificity. The truth of the matter is, in the designs that we did so far, they are quite specific, actually. And frankly, we lucked up. We simply optimized what we call the target state, what we're interested in. And because, in this particular case, these proteins really encase their ligand completely, <coughs> packing interactions of the target are enough to give you a lot of specificity. But in general, and we just started doing this, in general, you can actually, in your, in your search algorithms, explicitly optimize specificity by providing decoy sets that you really don't want to bind. And you simultaneously optimize the energy for the target and the energy gap between the decoys. And that can be, that's very nice to put into the algorithms, and we just started doing that. And uh, for DNA binding proteins, which we started to work with, that works brilliantly. Would you see any way of comparing the uh, complexity of sequence search used by nature during evolution? with the complexity that, uh, of your calculations? And would you see any meaning to such a comparison? Uh, we've, we've started to think about how to do that. So the, the, the answer is, you know, what, the question is, if I may rephrase it, is what does computational design inform us about natural evolution processes? Because in computational design, the beauty of computational design is that we can survey this huge sequence space that's clearly not accessible to random walks in evolution space. And one of the things that we'd like to be able to do is to take uh, proteins and see whether we can morph them in a continuous walk from one into the other uh, 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 to see whether it's possible to recreate plausible evolutionary paths. Um, that's not quite what you asked, but it's, it's what we're thinking of. Right. Hmm? All right, last question. Last question. In buried areas, each amino acid might interact with something like six or seven other um, amino acids. You briefly mentioned uh, a stage in the computational process. Um, I think the phrase was um, pairwise decomposition was necessary. Could you expand on that slightly? Um, so you're quite right that uh, buried amino acids have multiple interaction partners. Pairwise decomposition is, 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 is a technical constraint where uh, only a, a particular residue can only, in the, in the calculation, can only know about the interaction with one other residue. And you look at the sum of the pairwise interactions which you actually are minimizing, OK? And that works great for one of us interactions. Anything that really is, you know, where you only need to know about your nearest neighbor. Where it doesn't work so well, you have to make approximations are in electrostatics and in solvation effects. But it, the approximations work well enough. But that's the reason that we use these so-called orthogonal energies where we have non-pairwise, where we don't have to uh, constrain ourselves to pairwise decomposable uh, residues. In terms of this multiple uh, interactions, there's one uh, other point I wanted to make about that. It is that, that aspect that a given that the layer of residues that we are optimizing to interact with the ligand also has to op interact with the rest of the protein matrix, okay? That we started, so you may have to have secondary layers. That's what we have started to optimize and what was necessary to get really rather stable Novotims. And that's something that we begin to do more and more routinely. So we, we are more and more extensively redesigning both for binding and activity and from, for protein stability to deal with this, this issue of, of all the, all, optimizing all the intera interactions simultaneously. All right, let's thank Hama again, please. So our next speaker is Wendell Lim from the University of California at San Francisco, and he'll be talking about rewiring cell signaling pathways. So let me start by thanking uh, Drew and the other organizers for inviting me to this very historic meeting. It's uh, especially gratifying for me to, to come here and see this very uh, excited uh, set of speakers and audience uh, who uh, are interested in these sorts of approaches, especially coming from a uh, <coughs> biological community where um, people really don't know what to think about applying engineering approaches to understanding biological problems. 
Oh, how come it's not on? It was. Do I need to? No, I'm number two. I had it. Okay. Okay. So I can't really see. Let me come over here. Okay. So um, the the problem that my lab is interested in. Uh, is uh, trying to understand how cells process information and make decisions. Uh, so we study eukaryotic signal transduction, and what we know is that uh, cells are able to make very complex decisions uh, reading in environmental signals through using uh, a, a complex network of signal transduction proteins. And the responses that um, uh, cells are capable of, of generating are, are very sophisticated. They, they, signals can lead to changes in growth, differentiation. They can induce cell death. Uh, and uh, they, uh, they can, for example, induce changes in, in cell m movement or shape. And what I'm going to show here is just one of our favorite examples. I think that, that exemplifies the, uh, the precision and, and sophistication of cellular responses, which uh, is a movie, uh, a classic old movie of a human neutrophil, um, which is uh, uh, chasing after this, uh, bacteria, this bacteria. It's reading in uh, peptides that are shed by that, that bacteria. And one of the things that's, that happens is it leads to this very specific uh, polymerization of the cytoskeletal molecule actin at the leading edge, which leads to protrusion and one of the, the key steps, the first steps in this kind of complex guidance process. And so you can see this, is, this really exemplifies the type, type of very rapid spatial and temporal, pre, temporally precise responses that cells are capable of. <coughs> so we want to understand how is it that proteins and proteins arranged into these sorts of circuits can generate this type of very sophisticated response, but not only how they can generate that type of response, but how um, proteins are able to generate such a diversity of responses that we see in modern living organisms. <coughs> so uh, obviously understanding how protein network structure uh, or signaling network structure uh, is correlated with function is a, a huge area in modern systems and, and cell biology, trying to understand those structure-function relationships. Um, but for a moment, let me just uh, assume what I think everyone would, would agree with, that the network structure uh, is what determines the, uh, the behavior of this, this signal processing system. <coughs> then um, I think one of the most important questions from perhaps a more evolutionary standpoint uh, is this question of, how is it then that novel network connections are made? <coughs> During the course of evolution, to get this diversity of responses, how is it that nature is able to sample new innovative connections uh, and then select from these to generate these, these diverse responses? And so what we've uh, undertaken in the last several years is applying a synthetic approach to trying to understand this question, uh, basically trying to ask whether or not we can make new connections and therefore new circuits within cells. Okay, so before I go on to talk about um, the, the work that we've done and uh, on signaling proteins, I just want to, for a moment, contrast this with uh, <coughs> uh, transcriptional circuits, which we'll hear a lot about in, in later talks today and tomorrow. But what I want to emphasize is that we, I think this is really a given, that, that transcriptional nodes and the circuits that they can build are highly modular, uh, structurally and functionally so. <coughs> it's relatively easy uh, to make uh, what I would consider evolutionarily innovative changes in output, input-output connectivities through a simple recombination events. For example, simply just swapping in a new gene, like a reporter construct, GFP, or LAGZ, uh, <coughs> is a very mundane thing in today's world. But from an evolutionary standpoint, it's a radical change <coughs> if you now hook up a novel uh, gene product to a, 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 a different uh, input uh, uh, set of inputs. Uh, moreover, in many cases, we can easily recognize uh, modular uh, uh, upstream activating sequences or, or, uh, or, or repressor binding sequences that can be used to modulate and lead to complex um, combinatorial uh, signaling in terms of what sort of input relationships you have. Uh, and so as a result, transcriptional circuits uh, are, are highly engineerable and evolvable, and they've led to the very uh, remarkable things that, that I think we're going to hear about in later talks. Um, <clears throat> but let's talk about protein circuits. Uh, one of the reasons why this is, is so modular, these sorts of things, is because they're all mediated through modulating one basic piece of machinery, RNA polymerase and, and the other basal transcriptional machinery. Uh, but protein circuits are very diverse. Uh, proteins transmit signals in, in, in terms of the, in the cytoplasm uh, through diverse mechanisms, through protein-protein interactions, through covalent modification, through second messengers. And so 
uh, how do you, it's harder to understand how you could get the same sort of uh, modula, functional modularity that's, that's as interchangeable as in the case of transcription. Now, <clears throat> about a decade ago, as people started to, to identify many of the proteins that were involved in eukaryotic signal transduction, I think one of the really big breakthroughs was the discovery that actually signaling proteins, many of them actually look modular, so they have a modular structure. Uh, if you look at uh, many of these sequences, uh, the, you could identify uh, easily these sequence homology domains, like the SARC homology 3 domain, that's what SH3 stands for, um, that are found in very diverse sets of proteins, all involved in signaling, even though some might be involved in neuronal signaling, some might be involved in development, etc. Um, <clears throat> and what's been discovered is that these are, uh, in, in the most cases, uh, structurally uh, independent folding units that have some simple function. Some of them are catalytic, like kinases and phosphatases that actually transmit information. Uh, but actually, the vast majority are interaction domains. And within this, the vast majority are protein-protein interaction domains. So for example, the SH3 domain, uh, the structure of which is shown down here, is a module that actually recognizes specifically uh, short proline-rich peptides. So there's a cognate sequence that it recognizes. Um, <clears throat> and so that's its simple function. So <clears throat> there are several uh, big questions that we were interested in trying to understand. One is this question of, it looks like proteins, signaling proteins are structurally modular, that they might have this sort of modular logic to them. Um, and, and that's supported by the finding that, for example, as you look up, look from, from, from worms to man, that actually the number of domains you see doesn't increase much, but rather the number of combinations seems to be correlated with phenotypic complexity. But what, what really isn't, hasn't been proven or w wasn't clear is, was that whether these domains really are functionally modular. Can they be put together in different ways to create new functions in the same way that we know we can do with transcriptional elements? Um, and, and, and if this, of course, is true, uh, then, of course, we want to try to understand what is the logic by which you take these simple components that start out with one simple function, like recognition of a peptide, and how you take multiple ones of these and assemble them into uh, larger machines or circuits that show the complex functions like that neutrophil that I showed before. Okay, so our approach has been to try to, to use a synthetic approach, that is to try to put together uh, modules in different ways to create function. This is, uh, I, I think, different, very different, but complementary with traditional biological approaches, which are usually to, to take something and, and try to deconstruct it. We're interested in trying to put, take things together and put them together in different ways. It's complementary. And I think another thing that it adds to, not only is in terms of understanding uh, basic mechanism biology, uh, as well as the potential for, for engineering new signaling pathways, I think you really get some insight into evolution and how the process might have taken place. It sort of mimics that, that sort of thing. So I'm going to tell you about today uh, two different stories uh, that we've, in which we've tried to use uh, modular mechanisms to rewire cell signaling to make new connections. The first is our work on trying to use scaffold proteins, that is, proteins that, that, that organize multiple proteins in a pathway and their role in directing the flow of signaling information. Uh, and then in the second story, I'll talk about our work on trying to generate uh, synthetic uh, gates or switches using modular domains. Okay, so the first work is on this, these scaffolds, uh, and this was done uh, primarily by a postdoc, sang Hyun Park, with uh, help from a grad student, Ali Zarn Park. So, um, <clears throat> obviously, when you're talking about a complex network, a, a circuit, uh, um, in, a, in a place like a cytoplasm, uh, you, you, uh, these aren't like wires, so um, uh, this is the, the, one of the core problems of how, how you get specificity, how do you get the right connections, especially because there are so many different uh, pathways in a cell uh, that are made up of similar components like kinases and phosphatases and other things like that. So let's say a protein X is a kinase, how does it know to phosphorylate uh, this uh, substrate Y and not to phosphorylate uh, its competing uh, um, hold on. It's competing uh, r related molecules that might be in the same cell. So the cell, in many ways, faces this problem that, that's similar to what this switchboard operator is facing. How does, she, how does she deal with this flood of information and make sure that it goes to the right place? And uh, I think uh, something that that's been, uh, has emerged in the last several years is the, the idea that these sorts of protein interaction domains can play an important role in determining or directing the flow of information. Oftentimes you'll find, for example, a kinase might have a, a dom domain that recognizes uh, a substrate that has its modular uh, cognate sequence. The, uh, the extreme examples of these are these scaffold proteins that have multiple modular interaction regions. Uh, and th these might, in some cases, and um, a growing number of cases, uh, recognize uh, uh, individual proteins that together form a specific pathway. 
organizing them in principle into a complex. And so this, this hypothesis has emerged that protein interactions, and particularly scaffolds, can uh, direct the flow of input-output information in biological systems like this. Um, <coughs> And so we were interested in, in, in trying to, uh, to test this hypothesis. Uh, what sang he turned to is um, uh, the, the model system uh, of, of budding yeast, uh, which, like all organisms, has to face uh, many different signals and, and respond in specific ways. Uh, two pathways that yeast are able to uh, 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 deal with uh, are shown here. One is, of course, yeast has two, mating, two cell types that can mate uh, under the right conditions. They release a pheromone that, that leads to the mating response in the partner cell. So. Um, uh, the mating response is, it has the input of this pheromone alpha factor that then leads to a specific mating response. Uh, the, uh, but cells also, these cells also have to deal with other environmental stresses. For example, they're placed in a uh, high osmotic medium. Uh, to, to counter that stress, uh, they generate a specific osmotic response that includes uh, high retention and synthesis of glycerol to counter the, the high osmotic pressure. Now, um, these two pathways uh, are different, um, but thank you. Uh, but uh, they actually, they, they, and they, they're very different, except that they use the same type of mechanism. They involve this MAP kinase cascade, a cascade of three kinases that successively phosphorylate and activate one another. Um, the, uh, now, these, these types of cascades are found in all eukaryotes, and there are uh, four or more, uh, at least four uh, distinct ones in yeast. Now, what's really uh, striking about this pathway is that um, not only do they use these sets of pathways, not only do they use the same type of machinery, but actually one of the kinases, the uppermost kinase here, Sterile 11, is, is the same in both of the pathways. Yet, biologically, under normal conditions, you never see any crosstalk. That is, you never see alpha factor leading to this activation of this and then crossing over to give you osmo response. Why is that the case? Well, again, several years ago, uh, there was a discovery that, that in the mating pathway, uh, there was a, a, a scaffold protein, Sterile 5, that could bind to all the members of this pathway as well as a molecule involved in the input of the signal, giving to lead, uh, uh, rise to the idea that, that when scaffolded in this way, this molecule, C11, knew who activated and knew that under that circumstance it should activate this particular kinase. Uh, more recently, uh, Saito's lab has shown that PBS2, which actually is also the MAP kinase kinase, uh, serves a scaffolding function interacting with an OSMO sensor and the downstream kinases. So the hypothesis is that the scaffolds have functioned to wire these input-output specificities. And um, <clears throat> so uh, what Sanghi decided to do, uh, among many different experiments, I'll just tell you about one, was to, to do what we thought was the most challenging test uh, of this hypothesis, which was to ask whether or not we could generate a novel pathway by changing the scaffold. Uh, so what we have is a situation where you have this, this uh, essentially somewhat promiscuous uh, kinase network that you're starting with, where sterile 11 is a node in this network because it can be activated by multiple inputs and can also talk to multiple outputs. Yet you don't normally see that uh, with any particular response, with input, and that's because uh, there are scaffold proteins like SD5 that organize, for example, this pathway and give you this information flow, or the uh, osmolarity scaffold, PBS2, that organizes this complex and gives you this information flow. So in principle, we thought, shouldn't it be possible to um, generate a novel scaffold that would now uh, organize this set of, of, of kinases, giving you the relationship of alpha factor input and osmo response output. So how do you do that? What we're starting out is two distinct pathways, two distinct signaling complexes. Um, <clears throat> sang Hyun decided to take a very simple approach to this, which was to first, uh, if we're trying to make this, this type of pathway, first to fuse the two scaffolds together, but then also to uh, make deletions or mutations that would knock out uh, downstream kinases in the mating pathway as well as the input reception uh, in, by the, the osmolarity scaffold uh, so that you couldn't have these, this input and this output. The only way in was the pheromone signal and the only way out was the o osmo output. Of course, this sort of thing, just bringing them together in this simple, simple way might not work. And so uh, he did first show that, that, in fact, this diverting scaffold recruited the right novel combination of kinases. Um, but then he put it back into yeast to ask what, what would happen. Now, what we've done here is um, taken a strain that, that lacks both of the wild-type scaffolds, and we've inserted our diverting scaffold or other co uh, constructs. Uh, what we're going to do is grow on one molar KCL, so that means they'll only survive if they show the osmo response. Uh, and uh, this half of the plate uh, is in the absence of alpha factor. This is in the presence of alpha factor, the pheromone. Uh, obviously, without any uh, vector transformed in, they don't grow. If you retransform in the wild-type 
osmolarity scaffold, PBS2, they grow and they don't care whether there's alpha factor or not. But what was gratifying to see was that uh, if you transform in the diverting scaffold now, it will grow, it will give you an osmo response, but only in the presence of alpha factor. So this pathway now with this diverting scaffold requires pheromone as a signal to give you osmolarity response. Now, of course, this is grown on, on salt, so salt is also a possible input here. We wanted to see whether that was necessary. So we repeated the experiment, now knocking out the osmo sensor show one. In this case, the wild type uh, Osmo scaffold does not work, as would be expected, because there's no way for it to read input. However, this diverting scaffold still survives, therefore it does not need this signal. It's specifically reading and only the pheromone signal to give you that output. And we've shown by uh, a number of uh, uh, other assays, kinase assays, microarrays, that in fact this really is a complete switchover of that, that, that response program. So in fact, uh, uh, he was able to show that, that synthetic scaffolds can be used to systematically reroute signaling. Um, <coughs> Okay, so uh, I think this, this is a, 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 power, a good illustration of how protein interactions uh, and scaffolds can serve as a powerful force in generating uh, novel pathways or connections over the course of evolution. I just want to point out some other work. A number, uh, there have been a few other studies that, that have shown similar types of things. Uh, uh, Tony Pawson and his coworkers have made synthetic adapter proteins between SH2 domains and death domains, uh, and these have been able to link, uh, for example, e EGF receptor signaling to induction of cell death, and I think that, that shows you uh, sort of the implication of how perhaps these sorts of uh, rewired pathways could be used to, to, for medical purposes. In this case, uh, they were able to show that, that a viral vector containing this adapter was able to lead to this uh, selective cell death of, of, oncogenic, of cells that were expressing on oncogenically active uh, EGF receptors uh, uh, and, and, and uh, induced cell death via, via cell death pathways. <coughs> okay, so the uh, second part of my talk, I want to uh, discuss uh, making allosteric switches that have novel input control. Uh, this is work that's going to focus on a protein called NWASP, which is a, a native uh, eukaryotic switch that regulates the act inside a skeleton, uh, which is involved in, in cell movement and cell shape changes. Uh, this work was done by two uh, graduate students, John Duber and Brian Ye, uh, with the help of the technician, Kayam Chuck. Okay, so uh, <coughs> in these sorts of circuits, uh, one of the most fundamental behaviors is gating. That is, uh, you don't have a, a signaling circuit unless you have a protein that uh, is, ha expresses an activity that is gated or controlled by some upstream signal. And of course, this output usually is then uh, an input for the next uh, protein in, in the circuit. Uh, so you need to have uh, switches that are capable of showing allosteric function where their output activity of some sort is gated by some input or set of inputs. So how do they act as these input-output devices? How do they integrate signals? Because many uh, complex circuits require integration, especially in a nonlinear fashion, uh, between multiple inputs. Uh, <coughs> that, that, of course, is also required to get uh, feedback loops, which are an essential part of any kind of complex uh, multi-state uh, response system. Um, <coughs> but again, I'd like to focus on this question of not only how do these work, but also how is it that new allosteric relationships are established, not only between input and output, but between multiple inputs that need to be integrated. <coughs> so um, when we think of allosteric, we think of our classical cases uh, where a protein adopts multiple states, uh, structural states, one that's inactive, one that's active, and various inputs that could be phosphorylation, could be ligand binding, uh, act to stabilize uh, one of these states and therefore change its activity. And to get integration, uh, you need to have multiple inputs that, that control that. And um, obviously, uh, one can evolve and, and make new, new um, uh, uh, activities like this, as, as Homa has shown, but I would argue that th these are actually quite difficult things to do. It's hard to imagine, uh, in an evolutionary context, how you could evolve radically new connections of the sort that would give you the diversity of responses that we see in signaling pathways. Um, so, so <clears throat> but interestingly, uh, in the last several years, as people have studied more and more the mechanism and structure of modular signaling proteins, uh, an emerging paradigm has, uh, uh, is that, that some signaling switches, not all, show uh, what I'll call modular allosteric. That is allosteric but that, that is mediated through um, some interactions of modular domains. So one of the, the classic examples are the SART kinases where you have a kinase domain that actually by itself is constitutively active. However, 
Um, <clears throat> in uh, the, uh, the, the basal state, there are two interaction domains, an SH2 and an SH3 domain, that actually are engaged in interactions with intramolecular ligands. These two interactions together lock the kinase in an inactive conformation. And therefore, now, if you come in with ligands that compete with these intramolecular interactions, you, uh, you turn that on. So now, this has become a switch that's turned on by these competing external ligands. The protein that, that I'm going to tell you about is this uh, protein NWASP that is a switch that controls actin polymerization. The way that it works is that it actually uh, eventually activates this big complex called the ARP23 complex that's directly involved in nucleating uh, 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 actin filaments, these polymers that push out uh, the, the cell at the leading edge, for example. Now, <coughs> NWASP itself is a switch that's dependent on two upstream signals, uh, a GTPase, CDC42, as well as a phospholipid uh, PIP2. The way that this switch seems to work for, uh, is that, uh, again, there are two domains that are required for uh, what I'll call auto-inhibition, this, this, these intramolecular interactions that lock this in an off state, but then these also bind to these ligands in a competitive fashion. Therefore, these activators uh, pop open and release what is a constitutively active um, a minimal uh, a catalytic domain that interacts with and activates the ARP23 complex and leads to actin polymerization. Um, uh, so, so what's interesting about these uh, is this idea that these have more of a modular uh, organization to them, are they potentially more evolvable? Let me just tell you a little bit more about NWASP, which uh, another interesting property of it is that it's an integrating switch. It essentially acts uh, like, not exactly like, but similar to an AND gate for these two upstream signals, uh, CDC42 and PIP2. Um, <coughs> This uh, is a, an actin polymerization assay uh, that I'll show a number of uh, this, uh, where we're measuring uh, using fluorescence uh, the degree of uh, actin that's polymerized in an assay over time depending on what we add to it. If you just add the ARP23 complex, which is inactive by itself, uh, and actin, you get a very slow rate of polymerization. That's the spontaneous rate of polymerization. But if you add an activator, you get, you get very fast. Uh, if you add just the uh, catalytic output domain of NWASP to that, you get this dotted line that you can see in the background there of very fast actin polymerization. Uh, if you now add uh, just a PIP2 or CDC42, these individual signals, you get very modest activation. If you add the two together at equal at the same concentrations as here, um, what happens is you, you get very potent activation. So uh, that shows how uh, this, this acts uh, as a combinatorial switch uh, that mimics an AND gate, uh, and we think that this sort of combinatorial control is important for the spatially and precise uh, activation of actin uh, in various cell biological processes. So again, we think this works because uh, the, uh, the, these two domains that are required for autoinhibition, this GBD, which stands for G-protein binding domain, or GTPase binding domain, and this basic motif, uh, uh, these are involved in autoinhibition, and, uh, but as the name implies, the GBD can bind to the activated form of CDC42, the GTPase, and the basic motif can bind to, to uh, PIP2, this acidic phospholipid, uh, thereby activating it. So what's interesting about uh, uh, NWASP and SARC and, and other related switches is that they share this common modular logic uh, of involving uh, uh, intramolecular autoinhibition. What you start out with is an output domain that by itself is, is constitutively active. It's not a switch. However, uh, you can put uh, overlay on this these modular interactions that, uh, uh, if placed correctly, might auto-inhibit this activity uh, and make it, make it inactive. Uh, but now if you come in with competing ligands, that this would now turn this on by repre the repressing the repressive interactions. Um, <clears throat> so you can see this sort of simple uh, logic that seems to be uh, applicable here. Uh, the regulatory domains, it, uh, what's important here is the regulatory domains are separable from the activity output domains, and in theory this is more modular and evolvable. So of course, what we wanted to try to to see is whether or not we could use this logic as a guide to try to reprogram the control of a switch like ANWASP. Could we take an AND gate that responds to these signals and change it to uh, some other sort of gate uh, that responds to novel signals? <coughs> Excuse me. So the first thing that these guys tried to do was to um, uh, try to make a single input switch that was modulated by a novel ligand. And um, so what we... Uh, um, <coughs> What we uh, turned to was a, a different type of domain, a PDZ domain. These recognize short uh, C-terminal peptides uh, that, that are found in their, their cognate uh, partners. Uh, and to make a switch that responded to a PDZ peptide ligand, what um, these guys did 
was to take the NWASP output domain and uh, attach to it uh, a PDZ domain and then at the C terminus a PDZ cognate peptide. The idea being that perhaps this intramolecular interaction would uh, repress or at least decrease the activity of the output domain, thereby allowing it now to be activated specifically by a competitive ligand. Uh, so what's shown here again is an actin polymerization assay. This is the spontaneous rate of actin polymerization. This is the output domain by itself, kind of the boundary conditions uh, of, of activity range that we could see. And uh, what we found was that when we took this switch that it was well repressed. Uh, but even more importantly, that as we titrated in increasing amounts of PDZ ligand by this color code, we moved to higher and higher activity that's saturated approximately at the activity of the, the constitutively active output domain by itself. Okay, so what about multiple input switches that show properties like integration? So because of the, the higher complexity of this, what uh, John did was to design a small combinatorial library of potential switches. In this case, uh, the idea is to now incorporate multiple modular intramolecular interactions that could be relieved to give a switch like this. Uh, we used a number of different components, two different length uh, output domains, both of which are still constitutively active. Uh, but to give some stereochemical diversity, we use different domains. We use the native uh, GBD, which uh, is involved in, in the response to CDC42. But uh, we also use PDZ domains and SH3 domains that bind these proline-rich peptides. And we had a number of different affinity ligands for these, because we have studied these domains for some time, that we could throw in. And we could put these together in different architectures, uh, different combinations with different affinity interactions. There were two basic classes that we made. Some were what we'll call chimeric switches that have the native GBD element that responds to CDC42 incorporated with a PDZ domain, and in other cases, fully heterologous switches that incorporate now a PDZ and an SH3. We've gutted the whole regulatory mechanism and, and replaced it completely. Um, so uh, these guys made 33 different constructs in this, this small library. Uh, and what we found when we then assayed their activity, either basally or in the presence of the individual activators together or, or in combination was that we got very diverse behaviors. So some were very, uh, were poorly repressed, uh, uh, actually relatively few, but some were very repressed but insensitive. This is an example of a chimeric switch that shows that. Uh, in gray is the activity of the switch by itself. It's repressed. You can't see it down there. Uh, uh, blue and, and purple are if you add the individual activators. Again, don't see much activation. And again, if you add both together, you still don't see much activation. So this is a very insensitive switch. However, there were many that did show sensitivity and interesting integrating behaviors. Uh, so this is a switch that is very similar, except actually that the affinity of the intramolecular PDZ interaction is tenfold weaker. In this case, uh, the switch is well repressed in gray. The individual activators uh, only activate to a small degree. You put them to, to the two together in combination, you get very potent activation. So this, we can create novel AND gates. Uh, and it, I think this, this sort of difference highlights how uh, balanced affinities uh, and other properties are critical for tuning the sensitivity and integration of these particular switches. Uh, this slide just summarizes um, some of the different behaviors that we saw uh, in a truth table format that's color coded. Uh, black is less active, uh, white is, is fully active. Uh, and, and again, we're showing it with no activators, the individual ones and both together. Some, as I said, are all white. They're, they're unrepressed, relatively few though. Some are quite insensitive, mostly black. Some respond only to one input and then just ignore the other one. Uh, we get some that look like AND gates, some that look like OR gates that are activated by, by, by both equally well. Um, uh, <clears throat> but, and then we also got this very interesting class of switches, which I'll call antagonistic switches, which was unanticipated, where actually you start with an intermediate activity, but then one of the, uh, uh, the activators, the, the ligands, the SH3 ligand, actually is a repressor. The other one, the PDZ ligand, is an activator. Um, <clears throat> The, uh, uh, but, but this shows just how the same components really can be used to make such diverse responses. Overall, uh, of the 33 constructs we made, 20 showed some form of gating, um, which was, was, I think, very interesting. Uh, as well, and then also about five showed uh, some, something that looked more or less like an AND gate type behavior. Okay, so, so that, I think this is interesting in the sense that um, the, 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 function, the space uh, is functionally rich. There are many things that, that lead to some sort of switch-like behavior. Okay, so how, why did we see that antagonistic behavior? Um, uh, this just shows, again, what happens in that particular switch. You start with uh, intermediate activity. A uh, PDZ ligand is an activator, but SH3 is a repressor. Uh, intermediate activity with both 
Why do you see this sort of function? We uh, have a simple model that explains that. We think that actually, in this case, the two intramolecular interactions are opposed to one another. Only one of them is, is acting in repression, the PDZ interaction. The SH3, we think, is, is uh, opposing that because, the, in this case, we think the two intramolecular interactions are mutually exclusive or anti-cooperative. And so in that case, uh, if you add PDZ ligand, you move more towards activity. But this is actually interacting as a sink so that if they're energetically balanced correctly, so that now relieving this would lead to less activity. And in other words, this is sort of nested regulation. Um, <clears throat> so uh, we, we see a lot of surprises. So um, <clears throat> modular domain recombination can lead to novel allosteric regulation. The space is functionally rich. About two-thirds show some sort of gating. Uh, the space is functionally diverse. We see complex integration uh, that's comparable to what we see in natural signaling proteins. And I think it really s supports the idea that these, uh, these uh, modules are very, um, uh, are, are lead to higher evolvability. So, of course, in the future, we're interested in trying to, to link things together into more complex circuits, using these sorts of tools to uh, explore questions in systems biology to get at the structure functional relationships as we perturb as we systematically perturb networks or create new ones, uh, can we understand what the, the details of the structure function relationships? Of course, can these sorts of things be useful for uh, altering cell behavior as well as for therapies? Uh, we, to really link things together, we're really interested in trying to turn to kinase phosphatase or GEF GAP uh, circuits, um, which really can be linked together very, quite readily. Um, <clears throat> And uh, one thing that we're interested in trying to do, for example, is uh, we've shown that, that if you take a, just a constitutively active GEF domain from a protein, you can induce uh, uh, philopodia, these, these structures that are actin-based. Uh, if you membrane target it, you can get the lamellopodia, even more extensive actin polymerization. Uh, can we now, could we take these sorts of things, regulate uh, GEFs and GAPs in, in some sort of uh, synthetic way, in, introduce things like feedback loops, and can that... Uh, perhaps be used to eventually, as sort of a grand challenge to us, uh, induce something where now we can, can have synthetic controlled polarized movement as we've seen in this, uh, this neutrophil. Um, <clears throat> so uh, that's it. And let me just end by thanking the people who did the work. Uh, <coughs> Sang Hyun, I don't have a picture of, who did the scaffold work with Ali Zar and Par here. And then the, uh, the uh, NWAS work was initiated by a postdoc, Ken Perhoda, who's now an assistant professor at Oregon, uh, but, but John Duber. Uh, Brian Ye and Kai Chuck did the, the bulk of the work that I talked about. Thank you. All right, thank you, Wendell. We have 10 minutes for questions. All right, I have one. Um, I'm curious in terms of the relative um, importance of the ability of a kinase to dock to its substrate and the ability of the kinase to recognize the phosphorylation motif on its substrate. So say, for example, you would have switched yeah. Fuse 3 and Hog 1 in those scaffolds. Would you have expected them to be even activated by the upstream MAP kinase kinase? Okay, so, so, um, <clears throat> you, you, right, so, so I guess you're asking the question about how important is the direct substrate recognition and that specificity uh, compared to uh, sort of uh, recognition mediated by elements that are outside of the active exactly. site. Yeah. So, I, I mean, I think that obviously uh, the, the, uh, the, the su substrate specificity um, in the catalytic site is an important player here. And, uh, and, and while many kinases are relatively promiscuous, uh, that will certainly limit the specificity of, of who it can activate, um, what, what partners it can activate, what substrates it can activate. But I think overlaid on top of that, these, these sorts of uh, um, external docking or, or, or modular interactions uh, can, can further restrict that. So I think, I don't think there's any one level that you get biological specificity. I think it's an amalgam of whatever works. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, I had a question. Um, evolution can design um, function in a way perhaps different than an engineer might design function. Getting back to your first um, work with rewiring, how have you tried any experiments to determine how simple you can make that signaling pathway still work? That's one question. And the second question um, was with the uh, allosteric switches. Um, what was the role of the spacing, the spacer regions? Was that the critical um, component in terms of um, determining what kind of behavior you got out of those switches? Okay, so, uh, the first question, could you, I didn't, when you oh, say so, so, Okay, so the first question is, have you done any experiments to address how much you can simplify that um, signal transduction pathway and still have it work? You mean the scaffold? The, the scaffold and the, the entire cascade there. Yeah. 
Yeah, I, I mean, that's something that we're, we're moving more towards. Um, I, I think, uh, <coughs> you know, to what, so obviously the one, one question is, can you really just take com three completely heterologous interactions and bring those together? Um, we've done that at, at le a level of one interaction. We've gutted it and replaced it with a heterologous interaction. It does work. Uh, but there clearly is a hit in terms of the efficiency. So um, <clears throat> I, I think that, that uh, what I would say is that, that the, the interactions uh, are, can, you know, really can provide a lot, but it's probably more uh, of something that would be an evolutionary starting point for a new, new pathway. Uh, these things obviously have been uh, uh, optimized evolutionarily with, with sort of higher resolution uh, features. The second question about the importance of spacing in the behavior of the allosteric switches. So spacing is, abs is very critical. It's n there, there isn't one simple relationship, but we can see within sets certain trends. Uh, so for example, you know, we can see alterations in the cooperativity between inputs, depending on the, the linker between those things. Um, clearly, you know, the, the, the switches that show the antagonistic behavior actually are almost identical to other ones that show AND gate-like behavior, except that the, the spacing is different. And I think it's things like the spacing that leads to um, whether uh, two intramolecular interactions can be cooperative or, anti or, or anti cooperative. Yeah, I have a question. Since this is a synthetic biology conference, um, I, you have all the ingredients here to make an exclusive war, and I was wondering if you're actually doing that with your antagonistic switches. Yeah, um, so we have thought about that sort of thing. We, ha we haven't sat down and, and, and done that. But uh, I mean, I guess that's. That's, I think that's an important question to put to, to this audience, right? Uh, is it, is it um, what are the things that are worth going for? Uh, that is, is that uh, really a fundamental element that will be useful in biological circuitry that, that we have to show that we can do it? Uh, I mean, obviously, some people view some, a lot of this work as parlor tricks. What, what, when does it, uh, what's, what are the right things to go for? But, and we've certainly thought about that, but we've debated that, that issue. Uh, do you have any comments, answers to that? No, actually, okay. I don't. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I can see that you can do it, but that is a good yeah. question. Yeah. That I mean, is, is, is the exclusive to, or you know, used can you in say nature? that you know, NAND is a universal gate? Can you is that worth making because of, of uh, Boolean logic? Well, it's it's unclear. I think. So I have a question about the uh, role of the local concentration of the peptide in the context of your full protein versus when you add it exogenously. So if you have like an SH3 domain that binds its target peptide, you know, if you just have them as two separate proteins, you're going to get some affinity, right? And then if you have it biting its tail, so to speak, and then you add an exogenous peptide competitor, right. um, what's the, how far up does the uh, KI shift? You know, and what does that tell us about? Because that could also sort of address yeah, the, right. the linker question. Right. Yeah. So, so I mean, I think it's clear that in most of the cases where we see good behavior, that the effective concentration is very high, and that you need considerably higher. Um, we actually use as activating peptides ones that are even higher affinity, and you the, clearly the the K activation that you observe is much higher than the the, the raw affinity of of those those activators. So I think that um, it it you know you you do see that the very high effective concentrations in, so, in some cases. Any estimates on how high? How, what? Sorry, any estimates on, you know, on how high the concentration you have? Um, uh, not, I mean, not universal ones. I mean, it depends on the switch. Yeah. Uh, uh, the cell is obviously not a bag of freely diffusing molecules. It's crowded, it's heterogeneous, it's compartmentalized. Right. Do you know of any instances where spatial and temporal factors um, significantly affect or perhaps are even used in these protein circuits? Yeah, well, I mean, I think the scaffolds are a great example of that. Those are actually, you know, that, that is uh, a spatial organization in, into a segregated complex of these signaling components uh, away from other competitors. And clearly, um, you know, and, and these events take place in a very specialized place in the cell. Um, so, so I think absolutely yes, and I think that that is one of the most important ways to try to, when we look at synthetic biology, to, you know, control gating, localization, these sorts of things. They're all going to come together uh, to, to, to give you the sorts of regulation that you see. Are you good? So, I, so the... Here, over here. Hi, hi Wen. Hi. The, your, your off states in vitro uh, decay spontaneously to the on state very slowly. What, what actually obtains in vivo uh, with, uh, the, with those proteins? Are they more stably off? And yeah, so, so can, well, you, we can you reproduce that more stable off state 
Um, so in vitro. So first of all, those in vitro experiments are all done at equilibrium where we pre. So so this isn't. Those aren't. While the output is kinetic in terms of the activity, um, the actual rate at which activation takes place is, is not really a factor here. Um, and and the thing is, that we and we don't really know uh, how these work in vivo. Okay, so. Yeah. Well, Wendell, this is a comment on your talk, but it's, it's actually more a question for Drew. Um, when I um, first met um, uh, Jerry Sussman and Tom Knight, it was through the medium of the immortal Mendelssohn et al. paper, Andy is here, uh, uh, Zoo et al., Andy's second author, in which uh, he showed that you could do elaborate uh, uh, Boolean operations using a, a, a Lexa RAS fusion protein mm -hmm. and program inputs and outputs and get all kinds of nice Boolean functions. And the question that arose immediately then and has arisen again and again and again is what, how valuable recreation of Boolean logic inside uh, single living cells will be. And uh, I know that uh, a number of people here <coughs> are thinking about this. This has not escaped their attention. But is there going to be a forum? Uh, a, a place during this meeting to uh, to actually raise what are the good apps that could be imagined from developing such a technology? Yeah, so I can just make a short comment on that, which is uh, sort of similar to the question that was asked up front, uh, that, you know, what, what, what are things that are worth going for? Because obviously there are situations in biology where uh, sort of uh, digital systems or, or you know, uh, uh, things that can operate with Boolean logic are, are, are useful. Um, on the other hand, it seems like from the sort of biologically inspired computing uh, view, um, y people want to take advantage of the non-digital uh, types of systems that biology uses. Um, so, so it's very easy for synthetic biologists, I think, to fall into the, 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 the goal of trying to make um, uh, Boolean elements. Um, obviously, it's important, but I think it's a, it's a tough question. I don't have a good answer. <laughs> I have a question concerning the integration of two signals. Um, for example, so you st showed two different structures that are made if your signals are, uh, if your ligands are binding the receptors. Could it be that it's uh, regulated more in a temporal fashion? That, for example, both domains can occupy their um, conformational switch to um, site. 50% of the time, and if yeah. both receptors are occupied, only then you can have full activation or inhibition. Yeah, I think I think that's true. I think um, in many cases, um, <coughs> uh, probably using multiple weak auto-inhibitory interactions not only leads to higher cooperativity in terms of equilibrium uh, input-output relationships, but also temporally that that it might be easier kinetically to open these things up. So I think uh, I think that's correct, but we haven't really looked at it. All right, we have time for one more question right there. What are the typical kind of flow changes you can get uh, with your synthetic um, switches? What, I'm sorry? What are the typical kind of flow changes you can get uh, for your end gate and all that? Um, so, so those are uh, about tenfold or so, ten to kind of plus. Yeah. To, to Order the native proteins? What's that? Yeah, that's comparable with the native proteins. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. In, some, in a lot of biological cases, the, the fold changes that you see, like in some kinases, is really not huge. Uh, and I think in part that's because you always have these, you know, say in, in, in kinases you have this antagonistic function of phosphatases. And, and, and part of how the switches work, the systems work is with this dynamic antagonism. So uh, small changes in, in one and the other can b lead to big effects. All right. Well, let's thank Wendell again, please. <laughs> Our next speaker is Carla.